Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a podcast, strangely enough, about board games and how we are stupid. Fake news. Absolutely. I am your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my partner, my loyal co-host, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Always good, Mark. And this week, we've decided to shake things up again. We're going to talk about board games this week. We're going to talk about games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. Our feature game, which this week is going to be... Quartermaster General The Cold War. Yes, it's back, both the Cold War and the Quartermaster General series. And our topic of the week is going to be real-time games, which is to say games that occur in actual space-time as opposed to the ones that occur in a singularity. And leading us out, of course, is the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, The Aurus, which is where we briefly discuss what we talked about one year ago, or at least roughly approximating one year ago, as we've mentioned before. We're not so good with time. And this week, that would happen to be Gaia Project, which is what we talked about roughly a year ago. And Walker, I've noticed you've been uh, – it's, it's, Gaia Project has stayed in your gaming bags. Which, For sure. Which is a testament to its popularity because it's a strangely shaped box. That's right. And you've been playing it semi-regularly ever since we reviewed it. semi right? It's still, I think, my favorite game still out right now as far as I can think off the top of my head. Still love it. Still think it's a fantastic system. So it is Eclipse to no pun intended, Hands of Teutonica. A little bit, I think so. Mm. Not that they're similar games. It's just, just for its accessibility. I think, uh, I think it's a lot. People feel as though they're more involved in Gaia Project, where in uh, Hands of Teutonica they can, it can get away from them very quickly, where they don't realize how it works, so they might not enjoy the experience as much as they would Gaia Project the first time. But if they play, you know, Hands of Teutonica a bunch of times, they'll see the nuances of it. I think what you're talking about is player interaction. Yes. Yes. Uh, I actually haven't played Gaia Project since we reviewed it, and in, in, in part, I'm a little regretful. Having spent a year apart from the design, again, my, my criticisms of Gaia Project, uh, you know, I stand by them, but I'm wondering if with a little bit of time and distance, especially since the past few months have seen us review a fair number of Euro games that I thought were a little bloated for no payoff. Uh, I remember thinking that Gaia Project was a little bloated for no payoff, but in hindsight, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if, you know, if it certainly had more payoff than some of the other more recent Euros that I haven't enjoyed as much. So I would like to try it again uh, sometime soon, and I will certainly share my opinions when that happens. But as it stands, until that happens, I was always right. And then when I change my mind later, I'll still always be right. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. It's true. All right. These things are true. These things coming from your mouth. So let's talk about the games we played last week. What did you play last week, Walker? I played Minera. We've talked about it several times. It's a uh, dexterity game from Zock Spiel. The designer is Oliver Reichberg. And the experience was pretty different than we usually do. Usually we're playing a game once and they go away and we don't play them for quite a while. And this is one of those times that I really enjoy the hobby where I've played with someone that had not played games very much. You know, they're like Euchre, Poker, no board games. And then you see the look on their face when they realize there's this new thing out there, you know, this totally, and it's like, oh my God, this is fun. And we played like seven times in a row. <laughs> it was super fun and we had a fantastic time. We've said it a million times before, and it really bears repeating. Co-op dexterity games are revelatory for so many people. Well, that being said, she did not act, treat it like a co-op game. You seem to have this problem all the time. You see, if if one of us knocked it over, they would be the loser, and the other person would be the winner. <laughs> she, you know, because there's not many co-op games out there, like for you know, rummy or you know, card games or you know, traditional family games. There's not many co-ops out there, so this this concept of working together for for a goal is is still new. So we'll work on that. But other than that, it was a great time. Baby steps. Baby I, steps, exactly. Much like you, on and off, I've been playing Minara now and then. And it really does – it's a really great social experience. It's one of those great co-ops where if you're worried about micromanagement of other people's turns, the so-called sock puppet or alpha gamer problem, which again is not a problem I often have in games, or at least it's not a problem that I tell my fellow players to have in games. But in a dexterity game, there's only so much you can do. At the end of the day, someone's in charge. And I really do think that the skill threshold for Minara is a little bit higher than it might appear. It's not the deepest thing in the world, but knowing what is in the various decks, which I wish they'd put on a player aid, just so everyone could know the composition of the different decks from which you pull. Because the big challenge in Minara as a, as a co-op dexterity game is you pull a card and then you have to fulfill a task there. But sometimes just the board position means you cannot fulfill a certain task. So there's a little element of risk-taking there and knowing when to push your luck and knowing when to do those things. And, and that horizon is one of those things that's not immediately evident, or at least it wasn't for me for first play. And that, I think, shows the depth of the design. So yeah, Minara is a, is a consistent winner. Agreed. What did you play, Mark? 
We pulled out Massive Darkness. Uh, Louis in our gaming group had been uh, agitating for Zombicide, and whenever anyone agitates for Zombicide, I either head for the door or suggest Massive Darkness as an alternative. Because when it comes to literally kicking down doors and murdering a whole bunch of things, Massive Darkness is my preferred flavor of cute but stupid. And make no mistake, it is very stupid. I, I don't think that Massive Darkness is a good game, but I enjoy it a great deal. I really, it's one of those things that that just sort of. If you're going to do a game like that, I think what you want to do is let people do cool things. And one of the ways to do that, and another salient virtue of games in the genre, is if you give them the fire hose of loot. You don't want to involve. You don't want to get involved in like little small ball antics and things like that. It, you know, if, if a game has strategic depth, I'm certainly willing to engage in. You know, calculating for a marginal benefit, things like Doom Rock, things like Guards of Atlantis, things like that, where a minor tactical benefit. But look, if I'm going to play something silly like Massive Darkness, I want 17 treasure cards over the course of the game and be able to play with stuff like that. And that's that's very much what it does. Again, we've commented done this before. It suffered very badly from initial expectations. They, they grafted on this incredibly dumb campaign mode that is so bad. And that was a lot of people's first experiences with Massive Darkness. And in fairness, the scenario design is a little bit lopsided. Not all the scenarios are equally fun. But I, I will say this, though, in terms of recent experiences with, with, with Massive Darkness. One thing I did which really paid substantial dividends was right when I was pulling out the box, I handed people components and said, you are exclusively in charge of this. You're in charge of the treasure cards. It went so far that someone even said, well, what do I do with the band that was around them? It's like, that's your problem. I'm not touching anything with this until the end of the game. And even then, I expect it to be presented to me as a perfect little package. So I just put it back in the box. Because if one person has to run everything, Massive Darkness is a bear. Because there's what? Uh, there's 10 decks of cards just from the monsters and treasures alone. Anyhow. Played properly, I think Massive Darkness can be fun. Yeah, I want to play it more because it has that awesome system that drew me to get it in the first place is the fact that the loot cards that you're going to get for a fight go under the boss that you're fighting so they get the advantage of that loot first and then you kill it and you get the loot i think that's a really cool system yeah and sometimes the monsters can't use it and sometimes the monsters can and sometimes the monsters really create a roadblock and again this is where it's a bit of a flaw of the design you have to be smart about knowing things that need to be ignored and you need to have a party that can ignore things and move past them or or, or kite them so that they're not a problem because it's it can be the case, and this is both a good thing and a bad thing, really, that your first monster encounter in Massive Darkness might be completely undamageable, or more or less undamageable, by your starting party composition. And if you just keep bashing your head against that wall, it's not going to be a fun game. And that's that's not your fault. That's the game's fault. But once you have a little bit of experience with the system, you're able to say, okay, we need to leave that for later. We need to press on and do other things and know how to do that. So not the deepest game in the world. Definitely keep it stupid, but I think Massive Darkness can be good for some laughs. All right, we got, surprisingly enough, we played Sentinels again. I know it's a game we hardly ever play. Sentinels of the Multiverse, fantastic card game by Greater Than Games. The only reason I'm bringing it up is that we sort of, you know, been talking about a little bit of creep with the new cards, and I think it's just becoming more and more evident that some of the new decks are a little more powerful, which is fine because we usually tailor our group at the beginning of it anyway, so we can sort of say, okay, well, we're only going to take one of these characters and the rest of you have to take the scrubs, but... Still always fun, always pulling off new and interesting combos and how the all the characters play against each other and how they interact with the environment, how the environment interacts with the boss because there's so many so much variety. I cannot tell people enough to try this out. It's a fantastic game. You're absolutely right. Our last session revealed that some characters well let, let's let's call a spade a spade. We played with the void guard idealist, and she is a beast. She will murder anything that she encounters. Uh, especially if you let her get going. And by let her get going, I mean give her two rounds to get going. Yes. <laughs> it is also the case that we our two support characters just happened to kneecap the boss right out the gate. It was just, uh, you know, a fortuitous combination of the right characters and the right cards at the right time. I will say this, though, about Sentinels, because I was going to bring it up if, if you weren't. There is one thing that I'm a little bit disappointed about, and that is that the last expansion, and by last I both mean most recent and final expansion of Sentinels of the Multiverse, did not introduce any new bosses other than the Oblivion mode. And we've talked about the Oblivion mode, and let's leave that in the past where it belongs. Yes. I'm really starting to feel the lack of variety of bosses. Now, make no mistake, there are lots of boss bosses, but we've played several dozen times now. I'm, I'm probably up to 50, 60 plays or so. And I'm I'm running out of boss variety, which is, which is a bit of a shame. There's still lots of character variety. There's still lots of environment variety. But that lopsidedness, because every expansion released things at a rough par, except for the final expansion, which did not introduce any new bosses for the normal mode, I'm a bit chagrined. 
I'm a little bit tired of the boss. I wish there were a couple more. Makes me want to possibly investigate some of the fan-made stuff. I was about to say, there's tons of online stuff that I've never even looked into. So maybe we find something that's super interesting. Who knows? That would be nice. I played Millennium Blades on the topic of endless variety. Millennium Blades is sort of a, a, a meta CCG simulator. It's supposed to be a game about being a CCG player rather than actual uh, a CCG. Uh, Millennium Blades is also, I think, good for a laugh in the right contexts. The, the fun for me in Millennium Blades is there's this endless deluge of cards. Any given game is going to have a massive card set, and even that massive card set is a small subset of the total available cards, even in the base box. Level 99 games tends to have the opinion that more is more and that nothing exceeds like excess, and sometimes that, that that's good. And really, sometimes what I want is to see a sea of card effects and be told, wrestle some synergy out of all this nonsense. And sometimes Millennium Blades gives me that experience, and that's that's something that I really enjoy. Sometimes, though, somebody stumbles onto a perfect deck right out the gate, and they only have to tinker with it. They're not really ever – they never really have to make a major pivot. And those experiences I find less enjoyable. And sometimes Millennium Blades leads itself to that. So it lives up to its name, which is Millennium. So you mill through decks Infinite times. Walker is trying to drop the mic, but uh, number one, there's no mic to drop. And number two, it's not worthy of a mic drop. <laughs> That's fair. It's, you know, it is a, it is a, a effectively, in some ways, a two-hour set collection game. Because you're either collecting a set to, to cash in for points or collecting a set so as to make a good deck. And I'm not always in the mood for that. That's not something that I want to do all the time. But every once in a while, I think it's, it's good for some fun. And the fat stacks make it that much more fun. Oh, geez. The stack. It's the best paper money ever. It is. I would honestly rather. I don't know why everyone plays with poker chips when they should really be playing with fat stacks all the time. If you haven't seen, it's wads of bills that are connected with sticker tape. And so you a dollar is not a dollar bill. It is a stack of $1 bills bound together in a sticker. So you literally play with stacks of cash. It's marvelous. It's super fun. It's the best component of the game. Probably one of the best money components ever. That's Millennium Blades. I finally got to try chick, uh, Chicken Rush. <laughs> That's the uh, poultry-based expansion <laughs> yeah, for exactly. Kitchen Rush where you prepare nothing but chicken. <laughs> I get to play Kitchen Rush. This is by our tip of your games. Commented before when, when you first brought it up, Walker, that I found it strange that it was co-designed by uh, David, and I believe his name is pronounced uh, Tortze. Uh, I, my apologies if I'm getting it wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong because it's a person's name, so I care. We're, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Kitchen Nuts later when we talk about real-time games. But I did indeed find it very, very approachable. I was a little bit nervous because the setup is very involved. You know, you need a specific amount of this component, a specific amount of this other component. There's a, a list of literally more than a dozen different things that need to be very specific amounts in specific places. And generally in a light game, that's a, that's a turnoff for me. But you took care of all that, so what do I care? Exactly. Uh, it must be like yeah. playing I, Massive I, I, Darkness I, I, with me. Say, I got to, you know, got to see how it felt for once. Yeah, it's not pleasant, is it? Yeah. So most of the time, I thought it was a fine activity. But I, it didn't really grab me in a number of ways, largely because what I was doing wasn't all that interesting. It felt a little bit more like busy work than actually playing a game. Procedural, yeah. Yeah, very procedural. Part of that was I don't think that the game really sold the theme very well because the dishes that you're preparing, I don't remember looking at any of the names of any of the dishes I prepared. And that's not true of other even similarly themed games, like A la carte by uh, Carl Heinz Schmiel. Even though you know didn't, it wasn't very simulationist, I remember you know cooking specific things in la carte, but the text was hard to read and it's real time, so you're just scrambling around. So I don't know what I cooked. the The notion of what your people are doing is also a bit weird. It did one thing though struck me as very very thematic, and that is the incredible labor costs associated with running a restaurant. Your food costs are, are negligible, uh, which doesn't strike me as particularly relevant. But just struggling to feed your waiters and be profitable was was a struggle. Anyway, I thought it was fine. Kitchen Rush is is, is perfectly pleasant, but I wish it had a little bit more theme involved, and I wish it felt a little bit less like busy work, and so that was my experience with Kitchen Rush. Yeah, if they, like, printed, like, had a picture of the dish in the middle of the card. Absolutely. Because you know I mean? the cards are fairly big, and all they're telling you are the ingredients, and I think there's a lot of empty space there, so if they use it, utilize that a bit better, maybe it would give you a better feel. I will give them credit for one thing, and I wasn't expecting this to be the case. Every dish comes on a specific sized plate, and you put the necessary components on that plate, and when I first saw the plates without any ingredients on them, I thought, thought it looked dumb. But once you actually have the plate with all the ingredients on it, it does look kind of cool. It doesn't look like anything you're cooking, actually. But it does actually look like a plate with food on top of it. And that's not nothing. 
So that, that was one little cute thing in, in Kitchen Arts. And I'm perfectly willing to try the expansion, uh, which you so yeah, so gingerly a, unboxed. We have a fantastic unboxing video of the dessert expansion for Kitchen Rush, and I'm looking forward to trying it out. Be all sorts of different ice creams and whipped toppings and pies and stuff. It'll be yet another thing to play around with. Looking forward to it. And those are the games we played last week. Onward to the news and why it doesn't matter. All right, I'm going to take one of Mark's, and it's going to be because I hate him so very, very much. Quartermaster World War II Second Edition has been announced. Ha! Didn't even know. Bam! I get my news from you, Walker. So there you go. So, so yes, yeah, so Quartermaster General is going to have a second edition where they updated some of the cards, bounced them out a bit more, and they're going to reissue it. So looking forward to that. That's marvelous. Even with the second Quartermaster General game, Victory or Death, they'd already internalized a lot of ways to smooth out the system. And the different expansions don't really integrate super, super well. I mean, they integrate fine. It's just they they now have response cards that work like response cards, but they're not called response cards. They're called bolster cards. And that's always a little trick up for, for new players. So that, that's great news. I that's think right. That's they, they said they're going to work reworks on the mechanics, so you probably just learn lessons from all these other games he's brought out and just make this way more streamlined and hopefully much, much better. Fabulous. So I've been commenting on older... Euro publishers getting back into the swing of things. Many people have fond memories of the Alia titles, the uh, Alia bookcase boxes. Most Probably the most famous t- uh, titles include things like Raw and Puerto Rico, and roughly 70% of anything Stefan Feld has put out over the past few years, because Alia, unfortunately, in the past few years has become nothing but Stefan Feld's personal imprint. And for their 20th anniversary, Alia is going to be putting out new editions of two of their games, one of them being Las Vegas. Now it's Las Vegas Royale. Before it was uh, Las Vegas Quarter Pounder, but uh, they got the metric system there. They don't know what a Quarter Pounder is. And Castles of Burgundy with integrating some of the expansion material because uh, Castles of Burgundy has, I think, 10 expansions, but teeny ones. And Las Vegas had an expansion, so they're integrating that. I'm a little bit more interested in Las Vegas because it's um, a Rudiger Dorn design, and I, I quite like Rudiger Dorn, even with some of his lighter stuff, which Las Vegas definitely is. And Castles of Burgundy doesn't really do much for me. But I'm I'm just glad. It gives me a nostalgic glow to see some of the big players that were salient in the Euro space when I started the hobby uh, in earnest coming back, at least trying to, to be competitive in the new market. And so I wish them all the best. All right, in some... Digital news, Mystic Veil vale is now available on Steam. Might be kind of interesting. I quickly took a look at it. It looks like they did a, a fairly nice job. It looks very pretty. I don't know if part, the part of the charm of Mystic Veil vale is actually taking the components and making the cards. You know, 100%. Like so I'm wondering if it's going to lose that and you're just going to, it's going to be much like that. Like when I loved Memoir 44. And then there was a digital version of Memoir 44, and I loathed it. Like, I it, I just couldn't do it. It, just, it. it really ruined the game for me. It's like, this is just random. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> it, this, it, just, it, it just made the game weird because it went through everything so fast, and the actual texture and the moving the guys around and the actual playing against somebody just, you know, took it all away. And I have a feeling it's going to be the same with Mystic Veil, vale, although I've had great experiences with the the – uh, Terraforming Mars and the Scythe one. I played it quite a few times, both of them. So I had no problem with those two. So who knows? Miss Vale might be all right. I probably won't going to get it. I believe it was like $17, though, for a digital version of a card game. Yikes. But, you know, there you go. So Mystic Vale is now available on Steam. Plan B Games, which is uh, Sophie Gravel's outfit out of Quebec. Go Quebec. And Egert Spiel are uh, putting out a new game by Matt Leacock of Pandemic fame, and this is called Era Medieval Age. This is kind of sort of a reworking of his Roll Through the Ages uh, dice game, which in some ways is kind of a precursor to the Roll and Write games that we've been seeing so much of lately. Anyway, the only way, the reason why I mention this is because, uh, first of all, Matt Leacock tends to do these things slightly better than a lot of the other Ulcerans, and secondly, uh, the components are just gorgeous. It looks an awful lot like some of the editions of Cathedral, which is a, a very, very good abstract game, I think, relatively light. Uh, well, very light. And has these lovely little building pieces that slot in, and Era Medieval Age in the prototype versions looks absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. And so I'm actually looking forward to giving that a try. Yeah, I did play the roll through the ages once a long time ago. I remember it being a pleasant experience. I can't remember anything about it specifically, but like you said, it's much like, you know, fill in the boxes, make your cool shapes, are the precursor to what is now taking over the board game industry, the the roll and write. Well, having having a shared sense of geography 
and of slotting in these buildings, making it more like a tile laying game. In effect, is I think one of those things that could really elevate what is a very very simple architecture, simple but pleasant. And you know, it introduces things like spatial considerations, a much more visual tactile appeal, more potential for player interaction, all that good stuff. So I'm I'm mildly optimistic about this. And Eggert Spiel tends to put out good stuff. I've I've had some very very minor dealings with some of the people involved in Eggert Spiel in the past, uh, Peter Dorsen and uh, Mr. Eggert himself, and they're all good people and they're very passionate about the hobby. And uh, they tend to have some very very good development work going on behind the scenes. So as I say, I'm optimistic about era medieval age. All right. So my last bit of news is just something that interested me, and that is Sentinels of the Multiverse. Back to it is has a role playing system on Kickstarter, and I don't do much role playing, but. The world of Sentinels of the Multiverse is semi-interesting to me, and I'm wondering if there's going to be a bunch of fluff and story in these books that, you know, would interest me enough to pick it up. I'm going to have to look into it. So if you're interested in the world of Sentinels of the Multiverse and the comic books and, you know, what went on, you might want to check it out. And it's doing the thing that most role-playing games do, which is you can give them a lot of money to get a beautiful, hardbound book and all the accessories and all those other things. Well, one one hopes it would be beautiful. Greater Than Games has had a couple of publishing snafus over the past little while, and they've never really done books before, so who knows how well it's going to turn out. I'm not saying it's probably going it, to – that they're apt to fail. I'm just saying that they don't have a track record yet. But if you don't want to give them all that money, you can give them a much smaller amount of money and get the PDFs. And that's very much how role-playing has been going in the past few years which I very much appreciate. Being able to give them under 20 bucks and getting all that material is, is exactly what I'm looking for and things like that. So I, I might pony up that cash. I might not. I have been listening. I think I've mentioned this before. I have been listening to the Letters page, which is their podcast where they do nothing but talk about the fluff for the Sentinels game. And it really is strange how much thought has gone on to their universe that never reaches even avid, avid players of the card game. So they've been thinking about this very deeply for a very long time. And so I'm, I'm at least glad that all of that prep work is getting a little bit more fleshed out because previously the only other way they've expanded the universe has been through Sentinel Tactics, which was, uh, <clears throat> let's just say, a better concept than a game. Uh, so who knows, who knows whether those other projects are going uh, to pan out. So good luck. I wish them all the luck in the world. On to our feature game this week, which is Quartermaster General The Cold War by Ian Brody and PSC Games. This is the latest game in the successful Quartermaster General series, which now uh, can satisfy any number of players from three to six. And if you really wanted to, uh, could model all the uh, global conflicts from 1914 all the way to the present day. So this is a three-player game in which you're trying to ostensibly recreate the broad strokes of the Cold War where in addition to the Western allies and the Soviet allies, you have the non-aligned powers, which represent India, China, and the so-called nationalists, which is a hodgepodge grouping of a whole bunch of other things. And this is following up on the system that started with World War II, then went on to the Peloponnesian Wars, and has also been uh, done with World War I. And now we've got the Cold War, which is interesting because it's a very different kind of conflict than all those other wars that it seeks to model. And we'll have some discussion about how successfully it executes that difference. So why don't you give us uh, a, an unhelpful summary of what one does in Quartermaster General? Well, that's what I do. Well, in Cold War, this game, it's all about timing, right? You get two turns and then it's a scoring round. So you're trying to set up your maximum scoring within your two rounds. But try not to get too far ahead at the beginning. You don't want to look like a threat because then you're going to get hit by your your opponents, right? You want to get your engine running under the radar. And you need to manage your whole deck. You need to know what you've played, what you have left, and you need to get ramped up for the end. So your enemy's depleted decks can't stop you once you get your big engine running. And to a certain extent, that's very reminiscent of a lot of the other Quartermaster General games. Knowing when your deck is going to be exhausted, knowing when your opponent's decks are, are going to be exhausted. But... Let's, let's lead in right away to what I think is the biggest structural difference between the Cold War and all the other Quartermaster General games, which is that the other Quartermaster General games were all team games, two teams going off each other. Whether it was four, five, or six players, depending on which version you were playing, it was still just two teams fighting each other. Now you're on your own, and it's a three-way conflict, which is fundamentally different from two-way conflicts, generally speaking. And that, in turn, influences how you need to manage your deck exhaustion and how you're going to target your deck, your deck exhaustion. Do you want to talk a little bit about... Yeah, well, I have that underneath on one of my bad points is that do you actually think it is a three-player game or do you think it's a two-player game with the nationalists just playing referee trying to keep the game balanced? Yeah, so let's, let's, let's talk about that. So 
the reason why I bring this up first and foremost is, and I agree with you that it's that it's a, a bit of a bad point. I'll come right out right out the gate and say that I think the Cold War is the weakest of all the Quartermaster General games so far. I'll I'll maybe give you permission to give your opinion later on. And one of the reasons why is precisely because I don't think this three-way dynamic works quite as well as it could. Now, to be perfectly clear, it's not as bad as many three-player conflict games. Lots of three-player conflict games just fail spectacularly because of either Kingmaker problems or, you know, A and B fight and C wins and all those other things. It's, it doesn't get quite that bad, but part of the problem is if you're playing, say, Italy in Quartermaster General, or, or Quartermaster General 1914, whatever. If you're playing as Italy in one of the two-player games, if you can't whack a specific opponent, that's fine because you can hit one of their teammates and it, it boils down to the same thing. So you can look at your cards and say, okay, I'm in an alliance. I need to worry about how to help my friends and hurt my enemies, but I never need to hit a specific enemy necessarily. And certainly not by yourself. You might coordinate with someone else so to try to undermine somebody. In the Cold War, you don't have that luxury. In the Cold War, if you need to be- maintain the balance of power, as it were, because it's a three-player game, you need to hit someone specifically. And if you haven't laboriously set yourself up in such a way so as to be able to do that, or if your opponent pursuing their own ends, whether wisely or unwisely, has put you in a position where you can't reach the third opponent, well then, that's it. And all you get to do is pursue some other avenue of victory without being able to constrain the leader, which is which is kind of unfortunate. Did you have those experiences? No, exactly. That's what I was talking about. And the other bad point is the fact that it takes about three turns in order to set up a combination. Like you said, in order you don't even want to get a foothold or you want to take somebody out of a certain area. It's about three actions to get these cards worked up and someone can just play one card that undermines that entire thing. So you've wasted three turns, they've used one card and 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 laid waste to that whole plan that you've you know meticulously set up. Well, it depends on the kind of card because one of the salient differences, and this I think was an attempt to capture the theme of what's going on, and also to compensate for some of these challenges of geography and distance and, and a three way conflict, is the heavy heavy reliance on what are called espionage cards, and as a result. Because these are face-down cards that have one-shot very powerful effects that don't, as a rule, rely on any support from anything else that you've ever done over the course of the game, there are some exceptions to this, but by and large, they tend to be these things like, well, it just goes and does this thing. It makes the game feel like a take-that game. And I don't think that a game like Quartermaster General wants to be a take-that game. That's And this, again, this I, I mentioned this in the context of this being a three-way conflict, is this is the way that you get to try to brush up against that enemy who's either too far away or you can't tackle them. You have these espionage cards to zap them. But the problem is you can't defend against these espionage cards. It's like, oh, okay, well, this, this effect ruins what I've been playing with my normal cards. I guess I'm done here. And it's frustrating. It's not. It's 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 a negative player experience, as they say on the internets. That's right. It just leads into what I always say. It's like, oh, I guess you drew the exact card that you needed, and now there's nothing I can do about it. And Quartermaster General, make no mistake, has always had a bit of that problem to a certain extent, but it's always roughly been kept in check. Whereas I feel like the Cold War really dials it up to eleven with these espionage cards, and some of them are fine. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disputing the central logic of the cards themselves. As a class of card, they're fine. It's just their effects tend to have an outsized influence on the proceedings, and what this leads into. And I'm going to mention this in the context of Twilight Struggle, not just because they have the same theme, but one of the common criticisms against Twilight Struggle is in order to do well at the game, or sometimes even in order to feel like you're having any control over the game, you need to know the deck. You need to know what the events are. I've never had a huge problem with that in the context of Twilight Struggle because you can hand someone the player aid, which has a list of all the events. And I honestly felt that many of the events were sufficiently historically evocative that it it, it didn't really negatively impact my player experience. Like when the Soviets take over Cuba in Twilight Struggle, I'm like, yeah, the Soviets take over Cuba. You know, there's there's a card called Castro and he takes over Cuba. Okay, fine. That makes sense. But in... Quartermaster General of the Cold War, you need to have that deck knowledge again if you want to defend against some of these espionage cards. Now, again, sometimes that's a question of, you know, knowing not to mess with Cuba or something like that. But sometimes it's just a question of, oh, okay, well, I guess this army that I spent so much time building up is just gone because the espionage card says it is. And even if you have a knowledge of the time period, the only way to accommodate for knowing that this card is there is because you've played the game enough times that you remember the card is there. And even then, as I said, you can't defend against many of these cards. So it, it, it doesn't really seem like it's a good choice. Agreed. Let's go over some of the good points first before we keep wrecking this thing. Sure. I, 
even though I talked about the third faction not being very powerful, I still think that all the decks are very balanced. Even though they have a little bit harder winning, I don't think it's so much that it makes the entire experience bad for that player. I think he did a great job of making all the decks balanced and they all play very differently it gave me like this definite i know you didn't say it's much like root because they're completely different but it gave it, it you know they're they all have different mechanisms and the way the cards work and the and the different balances like this relies way more on espionage these are way more status cards that do this and it, 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 very different mechanics for each deck i agree in that sense it's very much on par with the other quartermaster general games in that each faction has its own flavor and the decks play to that and their number of pieces even plays to that the other thing we just talked about, you might not, because of your card draw, you don't get what you want to do. But they have different ways. Cards interact. You can get combos off to get to where you want to get to, even though it's not like that one card says, okay, this gets me my army where I need to be. There's other ways to get there. You can either, you know, throw away a bunch of cards to get the card you want, or it's like, okay, this chains onto that, which lets me leapfrog over here. It was a three card combo, but at least I got that army to where I needed it to be. And it's the case that the turn structure in the Cold War is much more Baroque than a lot of the other Quartermaster General games. In the Cold War, you can play, and this is in the core structure of the turn, you can play three cards. You can play a card for Air Force, you can play a card during the action phase, and you can play an espionage card out. And this is even ignoring the fact that you can trigger any number of cards during your turn. It was not uncommon in games of the Cold War to trigger up to six or more cards just because, you know, you've got a weapon of mass destruction. More on those later because I think they were actually kind of cool. Trigger an espionage card, trigger another espionage card, play some Air Force, trigger another espionage card, play an action, et cetera, et cetera. And this was uh, neat because you could set up those combos. But again, these are not combos that can... Some of these elements of these combos cannot be defended against. And number two, I really felt the downtime in the Cold War, more than I have in the other Quartermaster General games. The World War II version is a six-player game. But again, you care what your teammates are doing. And so you feel involved even though you're not actually involved. And so I really felt the downtime in a three-player game of the Cold War substantially because people would just be spending all this time fiddling with their cards. And this is another uh, knock against the espionage cards. And this is just a general usability thing that I've noticed a lot. Whenever you play a face-down card in front of you that's then going to be primed for something later, I find that it reduces the smoothness of the play experience substantially because you're just going to be spending the entire time picking up cards and looking at the other side and then forgetting what it says two seconds later and picking it up again. And that just grinds things to a halt in my experience. Have you had this experience? No, but... Not with my turns, right? I don't know if you remember on my turns, I had pretty well always had my cards laid out. I do this, I do that. Boom. You know, I had the cards all ready to go and my turns were fairly quickly. But I, I during my turns, I did not have this problem. Fair enough. Because I, I was looking at them during other people's turns and saying, okay, this is the espionage card that I'm going to play. So I like lowered it a bit. This is the one I'm going to play for next turn. The, the payment. When you play an espionage card, more on this later, I'm going to cover... This, this next part next is when you play an exp- espionage card, you have to discard another card. So I had that card ready and the card I was going to play. So I tried to have everything ready on my turn to try. Because I did, like you said, I felt as though the downtime was great. So I tried to make my turns as quickly as possible. And it's true. You did a good job of that. And I was trying to do the same. But I still found myself forgetting what my espionage cards did and having to look at them again. I really, it's the same problem that I have with uh, Space Empires 4X. I commented that Space Empires 4X took too long. And again, it's because it has all this hidden information. And I, I don't know what, this is clearly a problem that I have to a much greater extent than you do, but it's something that I commonly noticed. If you put a hidden resource out on the board, even the person who played it is going to forget what it is two seconds later, especially if you have a lot of different stacks to manage and things like that. And it, it just – it's a design feature that seems to solve a lot of problems, but I often find it in, introduces a lot more problems on the back end. Yeah. So the next point I wanted to cover is how the game sort of evolves, is that you have this hand of cards. And some might seem useful at first and then they become useless because there's a lot of discarding cards from your hand or discarding cards as payment. And I find it very interesting that suddenly this card is very useful, but then something happens and now it's useless and now it becomes your payment. And now these cards that you thought were going to be your payment because you didn't think they thought they were useless are now, it's like, oh my God, these are going to be great. This is exactly what I needed. I just happened to have them. And I really like how that sort of plays out that, so, you know, you, some cards you think are useless suddenly become very valuable. And I like how that works. Yeah, I agree. It almost made the cards feel multi-use, even though they weren't. Correct. There were lots of tense trade-offs in terms of not just the standard Quartermaster General questions of when do I play the status versus when do I expand and all these other issues, but just a function of I need to dis- – you're constantly feeling the pressure to discard new cards to pay for other stuff, and deciding what to do with that is very tense. 
Next point I have is the early leader trigger. There's this interesting mechanism is if, if someone's 20 points ahead of the last place person, then you, the second place person has to feed the last place person enough points to minimize that below 20. And I thought that was a cool mechanism. So if someone like just runs away with the beginning, you could end the game quickly and, you know, move on to something else or start again or something like that. I thought that was a interesting, that's in all the quartermaster general games. So I, I, I still like it and how well, it works here with the pain of the points, right? Yeah, there's a sudden death threshold in all the Quartermaster General games, but this one has the, the, the paying of points because, again, it's not a team-based game anymore with two sides. It's got three sides involved. I actually I, I liked it in concept, and I liked it in execution for the most part, but the problem that I, that I found it introduced is if you are the leader, if you're coming into a scoring round where you know that this sudden death tr- trigger uh, might issue, what it does is it liberates you from these constraints that other people have. Everyone else who's not the leader in that instance, needs to be very careful about who they attack and who they who they hobble. Namely, they have to go after the leader. And as I've commented, sometimes you don't have that luxury. Whereas if you're the leader and you know that the second place player is going to have to feed the third place player points, if it's the case that the threshold reads, you can just pound on whoever you want because it's all the same to you at the end of the day because it's all going to come out of the same pool of not your problem. And so that element I thought was a bit unfortunate. It really did make the person who was currently in the lead uh, get more advantage in terms of the overall scoring position. But as you say, coming out to an early lead is disadvantageous. For sure. My next point I have here is the history. I like the history on the cards, much like all the other Quartermaster General games. Uh, it has a great title to the card. The The picture they have on it is great, you know, and it's interesting when you sort of mix up history and the, the timing of events. And it's like, oh, this happens first. And and I didn't really mention this at the beginning. When I thought it was going to be a Cold War game, I thought it was going to be, you know, the, just the standard, you know, political back and forth. And I thought it was fantastic. It's like immediately after World War II, boom, it started, which it did, right? And I thought that was I, – that's what instantly became interesting to me as soon as I knew that that's what it was. It absolutely gives you the same, the same thematic feel that a lot of the other Curtis Master General games give you. And I agree with you. I don't – I'm not particularly bothered – by the thematic disconnect of, say, if the Berlin Wall is constructed in the late 70s or if Castro takes power or, you know, some equivalent power uh, takes power in Cuba in, like, 1946 or whatever. One element, though, that I did think was a little bit thematically troubling, and I think they could have done a little bit better job to, to represent what was going on, is uh, in most games of the Cold War that you're going to see, there's going to be a lot of land fighting in Germany. There are going to be a lot of land wars in Germany here and a lot of airstrikes mm-hmm. in Germany and maybe some weapons of mass destruction in Germany, just a lot of tanks running around in Germany, a lot of firing in Germany. And that did not at all, like generally the quantity of armed conflict between the Western allies and the Soviet armed forces was huge. And that did not feel especially thematic to me. Definitely, it seemed a lot more like World War II was going on, right? This rampaging through Europe back and forth. It seemed a lot more like World War II than it did the Cold War. That's for sure. Exactly. And I, I will say though, that the changes to supply rules were very neat. I was a little bit concerned because one of the big changes in, in the, the Cold War that the other Quartermaster General games didn't have is that in the Cold War, enemy pieces can coexist in the same space. Fights don't take place in adjacent areas anymore. Fights take place within the same space, with very minor exceptions related to airstrikes. And I was concerned that that was going to lead to a certain degree of complexity or a certain degree of asymmetry or difference that, that Quartermaster General veterans would have difficulty grappling with. It really didn't. What it did was and I think this was great, is it made cutting off supply lines more interesting. So basically the the rule is you can't trace supply out of a contested zone. So if you've got a a supply chain leading back to Omaha or whatever, it is no longer the case that somebody has to eliminate a unit to cut off your supply line. They can instead just go in and contest uh, an area. So if you are suddenly contesting the North Atlantic, uh, now it is the case that their army in Spain is now no longer in supply because they can't trace back to Omaha. As opposed to before in Quartermaster General, where frequently cutting off supply lines was a matter of, okay, well, I'm going to kill your unit there, and then in the next turn they just build the unit back. And there are similar seesaw elements in the Cold War, but I, I, I did feel that this this area of contesting, that this element of contesting areas of geography really did add a texture to the supply rules that I appreciated. 
And the final thing I want to mention, and this is very thematic and very mechanically interesting, is how weapons of mass destruction work. And this is a catch-all term that doesn't just involve weapons of mass destruction, like uh, carpet bombing or strategic airstrikes are considered WMDs in this context. And I'll leave it to other people, not myself, to argue about whether that's an accurate classification. Basically, the way that it works is you, you prep a card. So unlike the espionage cards, it's not face down, it's face up. Everybody can see what it is. And in order to activate these things later on, it costs you points unless the faction that you target with these weapons has been enough of a jerk to you. Every time you attack another faction, every time you aggress against them under certain defined rules, any time you use a weapon of mass destruction against somebody, you are aggressing against them. And what this does is it makes it cheaper for them to retaliate with weapons of mass destruction. That, I thought, was great, both in the sense that you play out a WMD and now it's a threat. Everyone knows that if they attack you, it's going to be easier for them to retaliate. It's also the case that it makes the asymmetry really interesting. It's like, well, I really want to hobble you, but you haven't been aggressing against me militarily, so it's more expensive for me to go after you, but sometimes it's worth it, and so you have to take that hit. All of that having been said, the fact that the WND system is so good really, again, highlights to me how the espionage cards are a bit unfortunate because espionage cards can be just as damaging as weapons of mass destruction cards, but not they don't feed in to the system of aggression at all. You can play an espionage card that destroys a whole bunch of units or causes them to be out of supply and tremendously hobble a whole bunch of their effectiveness, but none of them interface with this notion of aggression or escalation at all, which is understandable from a thematic standpoint, because again, it's always, you know, local militias or subterfuge or something for which you have plausible deniability. But the system was so good that I wish it had carried through with more of the game. And it also really emphasizes the extent to which these espionage cards are just effectively free and just powerful effects popping off all over the place. No, oh, I enjoyed, in in theory, I liked that the, it sounded great. I found it a little bit fiddly, you know, how the chart worked. And like we said, they actually didn't even put the chart in turn order, so it was kind of odd and being the perfect, you know, chance to, you know, solidify the turn order, but they sort of jumbled that yeah. all up and, and exactly who's aggressing who and, and you know, constantly moving them up. I thought it was a little fiddly, but, but like you said, the concept is so interesting that I could overlook it. So I thought it was, I thought that was great as well. And my last point I have is that it sort of segues into bad because it's good and bad. Overall, I don't think it overstated its welcome. It's a fairly short game. It's a set number of turns unless there's a, a leader. But the one thing I want to cover is it peters out, right? Because it's much like the other games where you're going to have some little bit of deck death. Like when you have to discard cards or draw cards, you don't have any, you're going to lose points. So near the last few turns of the game, you're going to have very few cards. So unlike games like Gaia Project or or City of the Gods where you're cons- you're constantly building up and you're going to get this fantastic last turn and it's going to be this, you know, interesting experience at the end. This sort of just like fizzles out at the end. It's like, no, I can't do nothing. I skip my last two turns because I've got no cards. And I'm just wondering what you think of those two different experiences and do you think one's better than the other or is it circumstantial or does it depend on the game or just overall what do you think of th- of those experiences? So it's it's definitely part of the Quartermaster General experience that some people are going to be decked. But I feel that in, again, picking, uh, picking the World War II version as an example, in the World War II version, number one, if you get decked, probably some of your teammates are still going to be able to come and rescue you. And as a result, even if you're not doing anything, you still feel in the game because your teammates are, are coming to your aid. So maybe that's illusory. And secondly, in order to deck somebody, it's usually as a result of something that enemies have done to them. In the Cold War, sometimes you just get decked because someone was a little bit too grab-happy with effects that need to be paid for with other cards. And so as a result, yeah, it's their fault, but it's not as if the enemies can celebrate over having been clever. It's just the, the, the other person got exhausted. And I agree with you that all things being equal, a game should end on a high note so as to be able to do something cool very near the end. And I don't think that the Cold War lets you do that, and I think it does so in a more pointed way than the other Quartermaster General games do. All right, on to some more bad points. I think sometimes we already talked about being able to do anything you want by, you know, just spending more cards. But there are a lot of circumstances where you just get bad card draw compared to the other side. There's a lot of back and forth cards. It's like, uh, the you know, the different sides, it's like they concentrate in certain areas. And if they get those cards at the beginning and you don't get the counter to the end, then it's going to lead to these, like, you know, unbalancing situations. And therefore you can't react to what's going on. Next point is very limited actions. I know Mark talked about being able to do many things during your turn, like an air card and an espionage card and your main action card, but I still think it's very limiting, 
you know, at the end of the day, you don't really get to do very much. It's like, it seems very ponderous and slow moving throughout the whole game. Even compared to other Quartermaster General games? Because my favorite, just, just to be clear, my favorite Quartermaster General game is still 1914, the World War One version. And it feels appropriately ponderous. You have these battle lines, you have these slugging matches in various areas of, of Western and Eastern Europe, where sometimes you have this tremendous battle that's somewhat somewhat tense, and a whole bunch of cards get played and revealed, and as a result, nothing happens. And it's satisfying. It, it, it manages to have satisfying quagmires, which is very much part and parcel of the Quartermaster General brand. It's about tempo and m- knowing when to make big pushes and accepting the fact that sometimes those big pushes are going to be rebuffed, but hoping that it's going to cost your opponent more than it does you. So I don't know that I, uh, that, that I other than the issue of downtime, I don't think the Cold War was was more ponderous for me anyway. I think in the other games, you get a little bit more synergy going with the other players. Like they clear a spot for you and you push forward and it just feels a little more fluid. Whereas this, you're just by yourself and it's just, it seems more limiting. That's fair. Oh, and we got, I, we already talked about this where, where a simple action is usually a third, third, three turn process. And like you said, due to like an espionage card or one other card, that whole, you know, thing that you've set up over three turns is just, is nullified. But we already talked about that. Uh, so we, you could say that some of the factions are frustrating to play. Like some of them, we talked about each having very unique mechanisms and to some people's play styles, they might not like how that works. But that's the same as any game, you know what I mean? But they are very unique. My last bad point, we also have already covered that it can be said that this is actually a two-player game with the Nationals playing referee. The last thing that I want to mention before I get into a sort of overall summary is just a, a, a brief comment on how this game was fulfilled from a Kickstarter perspective. Uh, Kickstarter backers got their copies in both the U.S. and Canada several weeks after it hit retail. And for that, they said, look, sorry, we messed up. Our bad. Fine. Stuff like that happens. But another thing that happened, which I think is kind of unforgivable, and I mention it because it's happening more and more, is uh, stretch goals just got ignored. Promised stretch goals did not materialize. And they did not mention it until consumers started pointing it out. I don't really care about linen finish versus glossy finish. I really don't care. But one of the stretch goals was linen finish for the cards. The cards don't have linen finish. They only admitted that when someone pointed out. It wasn't in an update. They didn't do a mea culpa. Somebody on the Kickstarter campaign said, hey, I got my copy. What's the deal? You said it was going to have linen finish and it doesn't. They're like, oh, yeah, sorry. And that's not cool. That's that's unacceptable. I've, and I've been seeing more and more publishers do this, and I don't know why they think they can get away with it. The theory behind Kickstarter is this is supposed to reduce the distance between creators and the consumers, and sometimes that's true. But if you're going to mess up like this, let us know. Fans will be extremely forgiving, probably more forgiving than they should be, not that this is a, an egregious error. The only reason why this becomes an egregious error in this context is because the, the some of the promo cards, which were extra stretch goals do have linen finish, which is the worst of all possible worlds. You said all the cards were going to have linen finish, but now not only does the base game not have linen finish cards, but it's the case that the promos don't have the same texture as all the other cards. So it's really, really weird mess. I've said before, I am I think I'm done with this company, certainly as far as Kickstarter is concerned. I'm not giving them any more money until something's on the shelf. And as a result, I'm probably going to get the product sooner if it passes any prologue, so... All right, so in summary for Quartermaster General Cold War, I have easy to teach, easy to learn, easy to pick up, easy to get the flow going. The faction strategies that we talked about, the fact that they're all unique, they're easy to pick up and see how they work rather quickly. And like you already said, I I also feel that this is my least favorite of all the other Quartermaster games that I've played. I've been ragging on it pretty consistently over the past... Uh, several minutes. I do think the new supply rules are cool. I think the way escalation works is really neat. I like how it dovetails with the weapons of mass destruction. But it is the case that the espionage cards really sap a lot of the enjoyment out of the game for me because that's where a lot of your effects are going to happen and it just turns the game into a, a, a take that experience. I'm. Uh, it made me appreciate how much I, I liked the team play aspect in all the other Quartermaster General games. I think some of the historicity gets lost by its emphasis on ground combat and the, the frequency of units actually fighting. But to contextualize things, when I say that this is my least favorite Quartermaster General game, 
it's still pretty darn good. I still love the system. And a lot of the virtues of the system still shine through. That element of mastering your resources, but caring about supply lines. That aspect of having asymmetric decks with lots of different status cards and interesting effects to, to play to your strengths. And so if you really want a three-player conflict game, I think you do a lot worse than Quartermaster Done the Cold War. Because, again, that's a hard thing to do well. My favorite is probably Martin Wallace's Byzantium for what it's worth. But it's really, really hard to do well. And so some of the failures of Quartermaster General, the Cold War, I'm willing to forgive on that basis. And it still feels like a Quartermaster General game. And I've liked all the Quartermaster General games. So my disappointment is more that of a fan who wanted this to take the series to do to new heights instead of just showing me that I really do think the Quartermaster General system sings mostly when it doesn't have take that elements and when you're able to engage in team play. So at the end of the day, that's where I stand on the game. And that's Quartermaster General, The Cold War. So, Walker, real-time games. What do you have to say about real-time games? Well, I went through most of the top real-time games, and I own almost all of them. And <laughs> so therefore, I must say that I must really like real-time games. Evidently. Evidently. Let's, I'll just go through some of them so you know what we're talking about. Sure, well, I'm sure we'll hit some of them later on, but we have Kitchen Rush, Project Elite, Millennium Blades, Fuse, XCOM, Space Alert, Escape... Those type of games where you use timers, love them. So I still haven't played XCOM. This is reminding me that I should probably give it a shot. But what I've what I've discovered, particularly when playing Kitchen Rush, and this is this is one of the reasons why I said I'd come back to it later. I don't know that I've ever played a real time game where the real time element was able to compensate for the game itself not being something I'd want to do otherwise. And I mentioned this in the context of games like Dutch Blitz. I did not enjoy Dutch Blitz because it's it's just adding a real time element to an activity that I thought was pretty pretty unengaging, namely uh, a solitaire you know card stacking system. Uh, similarly, uh, Bananagrams. I don't like word games. Generally speaking, it's probably because I'm what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, stupid, curmudgeon. Yeah. That too. I'm, I'm dumb and I don't like things, but I didn't like Bananagrams because, again, the real-time element didn't really add anything. I didn't like the core activity and making it real-time didn't add, add to it. Kitchen Rush, after playing it, I thought, well, you know, that was smooth. It was relatively simple. I, I was frenetically moving timers around. Why didn't I, you know, I thought it was okay, but why didn't I really enjoy it? And then I realized what I was doing was kind of dull. I was just moving, I was taking a card that said, do these things. And I was like, okay, I'll put these pieces of wood on this cardboard and I'll slide the cardboard down. Okay, I've cooked something. And yeah, the real-time element made it kind of cool, but it, it wasn't enough. Do you understand what I'm coming from? I totally. But I think what it does is stops this thinking, right? Where yes. you can overanalyze every turn, make sure you don't make any mistakes. This sort of forces your hand. You have to take risks. You have to do it very quickly. And it forces you to make mistakes, which we've always found makes the game way more fun. Absolutely. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't like real time as an element. And to just pick an example, uh, to, to, to pick up one of our favorite games, I really do think that the timer in Space Hulk is amazing. It forces, it, 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 it manages to get thematic traction to enforce the asymmetry between the, the space, the slow space marines and the fast gene stealers. It encourages misplays and it keeps the game moving. So I'm not, I'm certainly not opposed to real time elements. And I'm even in favor of real time elements where they're not often even really hard timers. For example, Millennium Blades. Generally speaking, if you're playing with people that are, are of, a, of a normal pace, the timer, the, the actual time limit is not going to be a huge issue. It's just there to make sure that the game doesn't drag. And so there's a difference between games that are only really work because they're real-time, and then there are games with real-time elements. Again, to pick on Dutch Blitz as an example, Dutch Blitz without a timer is not a game. It's, it, it's more or less n not a game at all, much like your uh, second favorite game of all time. Your favorite game of all time is Bunny Kingdom. Your second favorite game of all time is Magic Maze. Because Magic Maze without a real-time element isn't a game either. Well, I can al you can also – I don't want to – you know, I, I would never put down Space Alert. But I think Space Alert will fall into that exact same category. Without the timer, you're just sitting there and you're exactly timing out when everything's coming in. You're exactly going to where you need and you're killing everything when it needs to be killed. Without the timer pushing you to do things quickly and make mistakes, Space Alert is not really a game. You know, sort you know, sort of within I, that sort of realm. I'm sympathetic to that. There's still enough calculation going on that there's room for mistakes. And I think you could make with slightly different 
card values and with slightly different station effects, I think you could make uh, a turn-based space alert by, by revamping all that stuff. Uh, similarly, you can do a turn-based Captain Sonar. Captain Sonar is a real-time game, and you, there is a turn-based variant that still works. Space alert, I really like though uh in it's it's my favorite real time game probably well it depends on uh, it's my favorite exclusively real time game because my favorite game with real time elements is probably either uh space hulk or galaxy trucker more on galaxy trucker in just a second but space alert i really like the real time element because you have to coordinate with other people you're not able to get anything done by yourself in in rare cases sometimes if it's a weak enemy you can just go and mash the laser button a couple times but even then you need to worry about where your power is coming from and many people point to space alert as having the real time element really solving the alpha gamer problem but again i don't have the alpha gamer problem i've never encountered it in most of the groups that i've played with with some exceptions i just really like how coordinating with other people and doing these calculations under a heavy time pressure is just really frantic and adds to the experience agreed other games and and again just to contrast it with things like millennium blades where the real-time element doesn't add much pressure at all uh another uh, area of game that i think where they're effectively real-time games and don't get acknowledged as such, is many negotiation games. Games like Citadel Confluence, games like Chinatown, because there's a significant first-mover advantage. And I think this is one of the reasons, again, correct me if I'm wrong, why you tend not to like those kinds of games, because you don't seem comfortable, for a variety of reasons, to be that first-mover, to be aggressive, to make the first offer on the table for somebody to go make a deal, because that's often what you need to do, because otherwise the resources are already gone and you're not in a position to get what you need. And they don't have a timer at all, but they nonetheless have this time pressure by virtue of the fact that there's simultaneous trading going on agreed and there's the other ones that have uh like a soundtrack or an app right and it has sound effects that you know double up on that tension right it has a countdown like fuse you know you, you know the time's coming down or escape you know there's a, like this build up to like the ending that really adds to the tension makes you make more mistakes and i think they do it. a lot of these games make a great job of doing that some of the apps i found okay some of them i haven't really found particularly good but I will say that one exception to my, my generalization that I don't think that real-time really makes a game is some of the real-time co-op dice-rolling games, like Escape, for example. I, I, I don't know that I've played a real-time dice-rolling game that I didn't enjoy. Rolling dice is fun. and <laughs> Rolling dice quickly. And rolling dice quickly turns it into a kind of a, a, a dexterity game, which we all... That's right, chasing them all over the table. Exactly, exactly. The uh, Probably my favorite of those is Project Elite, which, you know... Uh, was is is coming back with the, the the new CMON version? So looking forward to it. One of my favorite games, I think, for real time. Man, I love it. Yeah, you almost killed me when I said I traded away my copy. I, of... it, it was very close. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I did delete you from my phone. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot. Then there are the grabby games. Grabby games are also what I call the, the, the games where you have to match a pattern and then grab something before somebody else does. I'm talking about games like Jungle Speed. I'm talking about games like Ghost Blitz. Ghost Blitz. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why I love Ghost Blitz as much as I do. Because it's fantastic. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but pattern matching is not really something. This, again, is kind of an exception to my previous generalization that I don't like real-time games unless I would enjoy the, 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 the game by itself. Without the time pressure of other people grabbing it, Ghost Blitz is not a game at all. It's it's a pointless, pointless yes. exercise in <laughs> running through a very simple spreadsheet. Just parenthetically, I, I want to note that I played the last few times I played Ghost Blitz was uh, against somebody who's now sadly moved away, and he was a Ghost Blitz master, and he had this way, and he did it just to cheese us off, I'm sure, of moving very slowly. Because he just was able to parse what needed to be grabbed immediately when the card hit the table. And he would just reach over as it was the most casual thing in the world. And you still couldn't stop him. It was the worst thing ever. <laughs> Love it. Let, let, let me circle back to Galaxy Trucker. Because Galaxy Trucker is an example of a, a, a game with s- relatively substantial tactical and strategy elements. Still a very random game in lots of ways. But that added time pressure really, really works. And... Even though it doesn't, even though it has a non real time element, namely finding out how your your ship is going to do after the real real time building, there's not a whole lot of choices to be made at that point. Mostly, it's just watching your ship blow up, and it's it's. I think it's telling 
that my two favorite real-time games are by the same designer, namely Vlada Kavadal. Space Alert and Galaxy Trucker really show how you're able to make that time pressure work. In Galaxy Trucker, it's because you're competing with your other players against finite resources that, that will disappear, and you have to start making trade-offs right away once you know what the trip is going to look like. I know you never find out what the trip is going to look like in Galaxy Trucker, but that would probably explain why you don't do very well in the game. And in Space Alert, the necessity of coordinating people while everyone's running around. It, those those two games, I think, really show how real-time games can be done very, very well. And I think it is telling that they could be done as turn-based games if you rejigger things a, a, a little bit. Again, because games like Dutch Blitz and Kitchen Rust leave me vaguely unsatisfied. There was another game uh, a while back that almost worked but didn't quite. It was called uh, Space Dealer. They redeveloped it into a game called Time and Space. Not time and space, but time and space. Apostrophe N. I, I don't know why they did it that way. And it, all... makes it makes it easier to look up online. Yeah, yeah. It makes it a, hell, a heck of a lot easier. It's much like the game. Yeah. The game. <laughs> yeah, fi- try finding that on Board Game Geek. Good luck. Uh, the, uh, the, it, it almost worked. It was, this, it was this nice little game of sending your ships off to trade with other players. And again, it forced that level of interaction where you had to, in real time, look at look and see what the table looked like and have to get to various offers before other players did. And it used sand timers in very much the same way that a lot of games use sand timers. You're, you know, they drive your, what your actions are available and you can't use that action again until your sand timer's done. I really liked it. Unfortunately, it had some degenerate dominant strategies and, and, and didn't, didn't really quite come together. But I really do wish that there would be more designs like Vlada Kavatl's where you had a relatively heavy strategy element with that real-time element. Uh, together. I don't object to the lighter real-time games. I just really like it when a strategy game can be built with those real-time elements in mind. Yeah, Space Alert definitely does that. If you have not tried Space Alert, I definitely you know, urge you to give that a try because it is one of our favorites for sure. Yeah, it's it's the good kind of stress. I respect the fact that there are some people who don't want that kind of game with the good kind of stress, but if you've ever enjoyed the good kind of stress, I I, I would add Galaxy Trucker to that. I, I, I prefer Galaxy Trucker to Space Alert, but, you know, they're very different games, and one's co-op, one's competitive, but Vlada Kavadal, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to go on a limb. I think he's a good game designer. I think he knows what he's doing. Whew. That's, that's... Controversy. I know. Yeah, yeah. Unpopular opinions here at So Very Wrong About Games. Madness. So that's going to close it out for this episode of So Very Wrong About Games. Thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our board gaming guild, which is guild number 3236, or you can check us out on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we can. Thanks very much again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care. If you like the show, tell a friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>